Hi, this is your pastor, Father Engel, and here I am again. As usual, I'm here, and I'm happy to be with you. And as I, I always have mentioned, that uh, this is something that I never expected to happen in my life as a priest, to, to give messages through video and to reach out to everyone through, through Zoom and, uh, and all of this technology that helps us uh, during this pandemic and the, in the years to come. First, I'd like to make announcements. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, we have uh, uh, been officially given a deacon by the Bishop of the Diocese of San Jose, and a deacon, Lionel Mancia, is now officially appointed as deacon uh, for St. Joseph Paris of, in Mountain View. And the second thing I'd like to uh, tell you is, uh, is this about, it's about our school, you know that there will be a kind of some change, changes in the school in, in, in its method of instruction. And that change is what we now call the um, multi-age classrooms, or MAC. What does this mean? Um, it is an instructional method that helps, person, helps personalized education, shifting the classroom paradigm and giving the students power to learn at their on pace and academic level. I've always been in, the, in, co in collaboration with uh, our principal, uh, Mrs. Jennifer Garcia, and that uh, I support this multi-age classroom um, and module, and that I am, we are trying all our best uh, to reach out to our kids in the best possible way, especially during this pandemic. And for that reason, we, uh, we have come up with this. Now, uh, what are the benefits for this, uh, benefits of the uh, multi-age classrooms? Uh, one of them, or rather put some of them, would be it is a child-centered learning that is focused on its child's development, you know? And then uh, the social, emotional support and relationship also formed between the students and the teachers. And that there's a, uh, one, one of the benefits would be the active learning that is necessary for all children and the developmental diversity that supports developmental learning of all the students. And so these are one of the things that we look into very much seriously because the school is part of our parish and that uh, is part of our mission as a church to continue reaching out to our children and that the school is an important component of our parish. Okay, so that's all for the announcement, and i like to go to our main uh, message today. I'd like, first of all, to read from the Gospel of Matthew, and this is the Gospel that uh, uh, we'll read this Sunday. It is taken from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to uh, 20, 20. And I read... Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him, saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. You. Well, I remember years ago, and I'm talk talking about the late 70s, I was a young man. I was barely like uh, 
16 or 15 years old at that time. And I remember in one of the homilies that I heard in a mass that I attended back home, the priests asked this question, how do you know that you are in the right church of Jesus Christ? That was his question to the congregation. He was asking them, how do you know? What proof do you have that you are in the real church of Jesus Christ? And no one from the congregation gave an answer. And then he says, please read Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. And then he opened the scriptures and read there, I will build my church, my church. And then it says here, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then the promise was made, the gates of hell, hmm? or it, as it says here, the powers of death shall not prevail against it. So you see that the church is a mystery. You see, it is a mystery. And we know that the, the church is both human and divine, following the nature of Jesus, who is both human and divine. And we all know for a fact that Jesus founded the church. But what I'd like to do today is to remind ourselves about what the church, what the Catholic Church actually says about the church as a mystery. And we find that in the uh, 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 conciliar documents or documents of the Second Vatican Council, uh, which is the dogmatic constitution of the church entitled Lumen Gentium, Light of Nations. And I like to to quote to you in toto, I would say, uh, what that Lumen Gentium says. In the very first part of that uh, dogmatic constitution, which was uh, proclaimed by uh, Paul VI, under the pontificate of Paul VI in 1964, the, the document starts with these words, Christ is the light of nations. And for that reason, you know, uh, the church which was represented in that synod, you know, that sacred synod that gathered together in the Holy Spirit, eagerly desires by proclaiming the gospel to every creature to bring the light of Christ to all people, a light brightly visible on the countenance of the church. That's those words are beautiful because from the very from the very start of the of the the document, the church tells us that the light of Christ is brightly visible on the countenance of the church. And uh, the document proceeds this way: since the church is in Christ like a sacrament, or as a sign and instrument both of a very closely knit union with God and of the unity of the whole human race, it desires now to unfold more fully to the faithful of the church and to the whole world its own inner nature and universal mission. See? And so, again, here is the church talking to us, speaking to us about the very nature of the church founded by Jesus Christ. And therefore, the document says, this it intends to do following faithfully the teaching of the previous councils. Remember that the, uh, the Vatican II, I would say, is a product of the previous councils. There would have been no Vatican II had there been no other councils before it. In other words, we grow. The church is dynamic. The spirit is dynamic. You see, the spirit in other words, is guiding the church. And for that reason, the church is dynamic for that purpose. It learns from its lessons from the past and continues to grow through the power of the Spirit. And that's why the, the, uh, the document says that it follows the teachings of the previous councils. The present-day condition, it says there, the present-day conditions of the world 
add greater urgency to this work of the church to all people so that all people joined more closely today by various social, technical, and cultural ties might also attain fuller unity in Christ. So here we see that uh, the church, as I've said, is dynamic. No? But the substance of its teachings will be the same. From the time it was uh, accepted, or rather it was uh, taught by Jesus, transmitted to us by the apostles. And in other words, uh, the form might be different from our age when it was first received, but the substance of the teaching remains the same. And the document goes farther and says, The Eternal Father, by a free and hidden plan of His own wisdom and goodness, created the whole world. His plan was to raise people to a participation of the divine life. Because fallen in Adam, God the Father did not leave the people to themselves, but ceaselessly offered help to salvation in view of Christ, the Redeemer, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, as you find out uh, in, in the scriptures, no? that uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And therefore the council, or rather the, this document tells us that all of us, all the elect, all the baptized, before time began, the Father, it says there, God the Father for new and predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus, that He should be the firstborn among many brethren. As you find that in Romans chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 24. So that God planned to assemble in the Holy Church all those who would believe in Christ. Already from the beginning of the world, the foreshadowing of the church took place. It was pre prepared in a very remarkable way throughout the history of the people of Israel and by means of the Old Covenant. So, in the present era of time, the church was constituted and by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was made manifest. At the end of time, it will gloriously achieve completion. When, as read in the fathers of the church, that all the just from Adam and from Abel to the just one to the last of the elect or of, of the chosen ones will be gathered together with the Father in the universal church. So the dogmatic constitution makes it very clear from the very beginning of its uh, of teaching that the church is a mystery and we live within that mystery. And it goes on to say that the Son therefore came, sent by the Father. It was in Him before the foundation of the world that the Father chose us and predestined us to become adopted children. For in Him it pleased the Father to reestablish all things in Christ. You find that in the uh, letter of Paul to the Ephesians, for example, in chapter 1, verses 4 to 5 and 10. And it says that to, the, to carry out the will of the Father, you know, Jesus Christ inaugurated the kingdom of heaven on earth and revealed to us the mystery of that kingdom. By His obedience, He brought about redemption. He is our Savior. He came to save us all. So that the church, or in other words, the kingdom of Christ now present in mystery, grows visibly through the power of God in the world. And this inauguration and this growth are both symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of the crucified Jesus. Remember that at the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, the Roman soldiers who were, while, who were guarding him 
wanted to make sure that he was dead. And so when they found him to be lifeless, but they wanted to make sure that he was dead, they pierced his side and blood and water came out of that. Blood and water flowed from the side of Jesus. And that is symbolized, rather that's the symbol of the church itself, you know. Because again, I repeat what the, the document says, the inauguration and growth of this church are both symbolized by the blood and water which flow from the side of Jesus. And these are foretold in the words of the Lord himself, referring to his own death on the cross, where he says, you find that in the Gospel of John, where he says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. So, as often as the sacrifice of the cross in which Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed and is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried on. And in the sacrament of the Eucharistic bread that we celebrate at Mass, the unity of all believers who form one body of Christ is both expressed and brought about. And I, I like the uh, words of the, uh, of the document where it says, All people are called to this union with Christ, who is the light of the world, from whom we go forth, through whom we live, and towards whom our whole life strains. Beautiful, beautiful reflection of the church about the mystery of the church founded by Jesus Christ. And you and I are very much privileged to be part of this church. The church will journey, not alone, but with Jesus. Jesus is our head and he takes care of his church. The Holy Spirit that guides us to recognize this truth is a proof that indeed Christ is with us. And as he has mentioned in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, he says, I'll be with you always until the end of time. And thanks to God that he continues to journey with us. Amen.